Thank you. I love songs about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was a great one right there. Luke chapter 16 is where we find our text this morning. I thank you so much for being here. I'd just like to just say a big thank you for what you do for the Lord Jesus Christ. I appreciate people who come and sit and listen. I think that's a blessing. That's what you ought to do. But the blessing comes when we do what God tells us to do. And I look across the auditorium today. I see bus workers, bus drivers. I see people who are going to leave this afternoon maybe grab a quick bite to eat and then go to a nursing home or to a chapel ministry and uh, we're going to be engaged in the work of God, jump back on a kind of a, a, a bus on a hot day and take scores of young people home and families home. Thank you so very much. People that are going to be busy in the nursery this evening and things of that nature, thank you for being a working church. I appreciate that very much. Today's topic is, is hell real. I realize that on a Sunday morning it's not normal that a pastor in these days and times speaks on the topic of hell. I really feel very impressed by the Lord and over the last several weeks, though I had already plans to preach on other things and, and things of that nature, I felt very impressed to speak on this topic. And today is that day in which I believe the Spirit of God has, has, uh, has arrested my heart and asked me to speak on this particular topic. There are two things the Lord Jesus Christ was very common in his preaching. One is hell, the other is giving. Both of which that men oftentimes in pulpits like this one try to avoid. Because both of them bring an offense. I was witnessing to a man recently and about two weeks ago and I began to tell him about and talk to him about what Christ did for me. I began to offer the opportunity to explain to him. And when I came to the topic of hell, he said, that's where we're going to stop right there. I don't believe that. No way in the world I'm going to go there. And that man, he didn't want to talk about it. Man, he got so, got so afraid. I, I was witness to a Jewish young man on, on the plane this, this week. And, and he has finished his Hebrew studies. He lives in a, an eastern state, an eastern city. He was heading back to join his family. And he, I was asking many questions about what he believed. And then he would tell me what he believed. And, and I was very, very interested because they do use the Torah and the Talmud and things. I just I was having a great time. I said, has anyone ever told you what a Christian believes about everlasting life? Yeah, I, he said, no. He said, well, the best day of my life, someone told me about that. And could I share it with you? He said, well, I'm going to do my prayers in a minute, but I guess you can I said, I'll be glad to. I said, if you want to stop me anytime, you can stop me and say, that's enough. That'll be fine. He said, okay, that's fair enough. And so I began to share the gospel with him. He had no problem with the fact that we're all sinners. He quickly agreed with that. He said, that's in the Old Testament. As it's written, there's none righteous. No, not one. I got that. The penalty of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. He had no problem with that. But then I took him to the place called the lake of fire in Revelation. The second death. And begin to tell him about this place called the lake of fire that is the, the penalty for sin. And you never saw a young man get so nervous in all your life. Brother Mason was on the plane with me and he, he would remember this. He was sitting between me and Brother Mason. And uh, he started rubbing his leg like this. He had a, he had a coke, he had, he had his tray down and he was rubbing his leg and fidgeting and moving. And, and he was getting really nervous. And I was telling him, I said, you, if you're born once, you're only going to die twice. You're going to die twice. He said, the only payment for sin that I know about is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I began to explain to him about the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and then the penalty of sin, the lake of fire. And boy, he was just afraid. He started pouring the Sprite into his drink. And he was pouring, he just poured it all over the thing. It just filled up and fizzed up. And, and it was just made a big old mess. I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I did that. And we were trying to scramble for napkins to clean up the mess. And... And he just was afraid. He goes, no, what about repentance? Isn't repentance a part, of, a part of being saved? I said, yes, that's exactly right. Jesus preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. But just all that to say this, hell scares people. And the Bible tells us the Spirit of God, when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, which is in Jesus Christ, and of judgment to come. All three of those things are very present in my little mind when I accepted Jesus. I was, a, I, was, I, was in, I was a sinner, and, ha, and he was holy, and I wasn't. I was in trouble with the God that was holy. Number two, my only hope was the righteousness that was in Jesus Christ. I've never seen Jesus this day. I didn't see him that day, but God made him real to me. And then, if I refused Jesus Christ, I was going to the lake of fire, hell forever. Well, Jesus spoke about it very quickly, very often. You'll find it many times. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew 25 and Matthew 14 and Mark chapter 9 and, and all through the Gospels. 
You'll find it through the Pauline epistles and the general epistles. He calls eternal fire, everlasting damnation, the, it, with a fire that is not quenched. Darkness, where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. You'll find it all through the Bible, all the way to the very end of the Bible. And God believes hell is so real, He doesn't want you or anyone to go there. He tells us in, in Peter, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. In Luke chapter 16, in context, Jesus has given the story of an unjust steward. In chapter 1 of chapter 16, verse 1, he's talking to his disciples generally. And then, whenever the Pharisees heard about it, and he told them, he said, Look, you, you be faithful in that which is little, and I'll make you ruler in much. You, you be faithful with unrighteous mammon or finances, and I'll give you riches that are true and eternal, and things that only can come from me. And you be faithful with that which is another man, and I'll give you things that are your own. Because no man can serve God and man. And when the, when the Pharisees heard it, they derided him is the word the Bible uses. And they started getting fired up and saying things. Ah, and Jesus kind of went through and you can see him really start, start putting his finger on their sins of covetousness, of self-righteousness, and of immorality. And then he says, let me tell you a story. And he told them this particular story. Now, it's unique, and some people say it's a parable, but in parables, the Lord did not use names. But this story, he uses a man's name. He doesn't use the rich man's name, maybe to protect his identity throughout all history, but he does use the, the, the Christian's name or the one who had faith in Christ, Lazarus. So when someone tells me, oh, this is just a story that God made up or the Lord Jesus made up, I don't believe that. I believe this is a real story with a real name and a real place and a real house and a real heaven and a real hell. Jesus majored on that and, he's, and, uh, and throughout history, I think of William Booth, he said this. He said, there will come a day when preachers will preach a heaven without a hell. Winston Churchill, after World War II, he made this statement about Great Britain. He said that the moral landslide of Great Britain is due to the fact that heaven and hell are no longer proclaimed throughout the land. Just like your battery, you got here on a positive and negative battery. You can't, you can't, live, you can't uh, understand Christ and Christianity and the Bible without a negative and a positive. Yes, there is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun. The devil wants us to make hell a cuss word. Get real familiar with it. You can, just, you can hear it said, what the? And they just say hell with, the, it, with commonality. Even, even in, 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 in our own Christian language, oftentimes we say hell very flippantly. They get us to laugh at things and tolerate things. Now, hell is not just a curse word. It could be your future home forever. This week I was out golfing and, and, uh, with our men, and boy, they, we had a great time together. I hope next year when we have that, if you're, if you're any, any what interested in golfing, you don't have to be good, just come. We had a great time, but we were walking off, a, uh, off one of the uh, greens there, and one of the fellows saw, we saw a snake. It was a snake right there, and I don't know what kind of snakes there are. I know my dad was terrified of snakes. But he lived very terrified of snakes because wherever snakes were, and he, he, he lived 57 years, never got snake bitten because wherever a snake was, he wasn't. <laughs> Stayed far away from that. He didn't get anywhere near a snake. But boy, you get familiar with a snake. You get familiar with a snake like it's not going to get you. Boy, that's when you get nervous. And those people who train the lions and things of that nature, one of the things they tell you is that you never get so familiar that you trust them. Can't trust them. And Boy, the devil wants to get familiar with the term hell. I think of those who have died and gone to eternity without Christ. I have been at the bedside of a few people who I believe went to eternity without Jesus. And those are some very uncomfortable memories. I've been at the bedside of numerous people who knew the Lord and it's totally opposite. Voltaire, a very wicked, atheistic infidel in Great Britain, his nurse, after seeing him die, said this, said, for the wealth of all England, I will not watch another infidel die. Thomas Scott, who was also a famous atheist, on his deathbed made this confession. 
He said that uh, until this moment I thought there was neither God nor hell. But now I know and feel that there are both and I am damned to the just judgment of the Almighty. Remember an atheist little family had one little girl and and she, she went to church, and the dad and mom got angry with her because she's going to church, and he said, you're not going to that church anymore. She, she did without getting saved. And one of the, one of the little, little friends of hers began to lead her and begin to meet with her outside of church and begin to tell her about Christ, and she believed and received Christ. But she got very sick, and her friend would go and try to minister, and the family would not let her. But she got sick, and the little girl that was her friend sat outside her door, and she confessed to hearing these words. The atheist mom said as she was sick, and she was destined to die, said, honey, just hang on. Just hang on. And the dad said, just hang on. And the brother said, just hang on. And she said, you've given me nothing to hang on to. And that's exactly what people who refuse to acknowledge the hell See, why do you believe in hell? Number one, because the Bible tells it. Number two, Jesus taught it. No one believed in hell more than Jesus would have. And he tells us this story. Let's rehearse the story, take a few principles, and then we'll go home today. I do pray that your hearts will be open. pray you'll be sensitive to those around you and stay off your cell phones and other things that would distract people. There's no concession stand. You don't have to go out and come in. Just stay right where you are unless you're sick. Let's listen carefully to what the Bible says this morning, if we would please. Luke chapter 16, here's what the Bible says in verse number 19. There was a certain rich man. These are all words of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's none of these are, are mixed with other people's words. He was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which had laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his wounds. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That is the holding place, if you will. That's the presence of the Lord. And rich man also died and was buried. So we already know that Lazarus, and once again, the rich man and the Lazarus was not going to heaven because he was poor. He was going to heaven because he believed. Everyone goes to heaven, goes to heaven the same way, through faith in Jesus Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Faith is the only way to determine your eternal destiny. That's that's it. And it's faith in the right person, the person of Jesus. Well, then we find that the rich man, he also died. Look at verse 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and uh, Lazarus in his bosom. I want you to notice the first thing is hell real. Number one, hell has real distance. He said, I saw Abraham afar off. We'll talk about later, there's real separation. There's a great gulf fixed. But there's a great distance between people that live in the presence of God and people who live in hell. There's a great distance there. He said he saw Abraham afar off. And by the way, you have, he, had, he had eyes. He had eyes that could see. He had a body that could hurt. We'll find that. He had, he had consciousness in hell. There are some folks who teach in soul sleep that once you're dead, you're dead, and there's nothing like that. Other people like to tell each other that that once it's over, it's it's just over. Some religious sects teach that there is no hell. It's just a lower earth. The Bible's very clear that there's a real distance between those who are in heaven and those who are in hell, and there's, there's distance there. Number two, hell is really, there's has real fire. Look at the next thing, if you would, please. The Bible tells us this, and there are some very famous people who are preachers of the gospel, and I believe they they they, they do proclaim the Word of God, but they have a hard time believing that hell has fire. When I look in the Scriptures, I see that uh, I think I'll just take what Jesus said about that rather than what they think about that. The Bible says this in verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Boy, I have some water over here with me. And thank God someone puts it here every, every service, and, 
And occasionally I'll enjoy it and, and, and it'll help me. But boy, when I'm thirsty, I don't want this. I want to dip and, 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 and get till it's empty. And never in my one times, in, my, in, in the hottest moments, said, listen, would you just do this for me, Mom? Linda, would you just do this for me? Just put a little bit of water on my tongue. No serene. This man, he says, for I am tormented in this flame. Take it or leave it, friend. Hell has fire. So that's the only place in the Bible? No, sir. You can look lots of places. You can look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, and chapter 13, and verse 41, where the Bible says that hell is a place that burns with fire and brimstone. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation chapter 20, and I, it, it speaks about that, that an everlasting fire. It says, in death and hell were cast of the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 21, 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This fella was in a place engulfed with fire. Hell has fire. It has pain. It has torment. It has darkness. Think about the torments of hell. and It's a dark place. It's a place of, of loneliness, a place of foul company. Some of the worst people that ever live will be in hell. The Adolf Hitlers and the Jeffrey Dahmers and the, and the foul and the wicked and the, and the, the murderers and the, the incestuous and all through history will join you as a company if you go to this place called hell. There's real dis hell is a place that has real distance, has real fire, has real memories. One of the saddest words or two words in this passage of Scripture, if you'll look at verse 25 in the Bible, will say this. And Abraham said, son, remember. Some of us are haunted by memories. You're haunted by the memories of, of, a, of an offense as a child. You go back to a situation that, man, it just seems like it keeps coming to your mind's eye. We have one of our good men who responded to a fire last year. He works for the public service, a public servant, and, and uh, there, was several, there, was, there was found out that there was three children huddled around and been burned to death. And their, their limbs are all over each other in, in, a, in a home that was, that was on fire. The guys in his, in, his, in, his, in his group said, listen, I'm not going in there. He said, get so-and-so to do it. He goes to the church. He's a Christian. He can handle it. I talked to that dear man several weeks after that. And he said, Pastor, it's very difficult to get that out of my mind's eye. The memory of walking into that upstairs of that, 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 that room and seeing the little huddled masses of what would have been three little boys and girls burned to death. It's a memory. Well, he said, now listen, hell is a place where there's real memories. He said, remember that in that lifetime... You ignored God because of your covetousness, because of your, 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 your self-righteousness, because of you thought you were that, or maybe your, your, your way of thinking. Remember. So what are you going to remember in hell, friend? You remember every message you ever heard about the gospel of Christ and every invitation that you held on and waited for the church to get over. You remember the opportunities that were lost to believe and receive Jesus Christ. In hell, we remember every person who loved us enough to take the risk of talking to us about Jesus Christ. You remember the pride that welled up in your heart when you said, I would get saved, but everybody thinks I already am saved. There's two reasons why I think people go to hell, pride and procrastination. They're, they're too proud to admit they're in trouble with a God who's holy, and they think everybody else, it matters more what people think than it matters what God and you know. Or next week. Another time, when I get closer, I was speaking to a man giving his testimony this week, and he said, I went to church. I wasn't thinking about it. I didn't want salvation. And then, thank God, God convicted my heart, and I accepted the Lord as my Savior. Maybe you came in the same way. You said, man, I, I'm hoping we have a good Sunday. Hope the, sermons and, hope the sermon, the singing, and all the things, and keeps me awake. But you know, and God knows you're not saved. You'll remember. There's a memory in hell, a sad thing. Hell is a place that has real distance, real fire, real torment. It's a place of real memories, a real separation. Look at verse 26. 
He said, man, he said, uh, Father Abraham says, look, there's a, there's a, remember in your life, remember that, now you're tormented. He's enjoying the presence of God. You're tormented. And verse number 26, says, and besides all this, in addition to that, between us and you, us, speaking of Abraham and those who've gone on before who had ex exercised faith in Christ, and you who are in hell, there is a great gulf fixed so that there would not pass hence to you, and you cannot come here. You can't go there. I can't come there. No one can pass that great gulf. There's a great separation. I'd like for you to take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians in the back of your Bible. Please don't be a lazy Christian. Turn there, if you would please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Hell is a place of real distance, of real fire, of real memories, of real separation. What are we going to be separated from? Now, I'm not going to try to air condition hell for you one minute, but I will say to you probably the one of the worst things about hell is that God will never be there. And if God is not in the equation, there's never hope. I think one of the worst things about hell, and I'm thankful I'm not going to go there. I deserve to go there, but I'm not going there. But the thing I'm so glad I'm not going there because there's no separation with God. There's separation from God there. Separated from His presence. One of the most comforting things in my life is to know that God is with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He says, Lo, I am with you always. Look at, if you would please, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want you to see if you're in the habit of underlying things in the Bible, you'd probably want to underline this. The people in Thessalonica were, being, were suffering. And there were people that were anti-Christ and giving them difficult problems. And they were wondering, when is it going to stop? And what are we going to make sense out of this? We're, we're trying to do the right thing. And we're getting all kinds of negative things given back to us. Our son, Derek, just got back from India. And he stayed in a home. And one of the homes he stayed in, a pastor had to come there because he, he, was, being, he was going to be arrested. The... the uh, a group of people went to a Hindu temple and damaged their speaker system, and everyone blamed it on the Baptist church. The pastor of Baptist church, they were looking for him to throw him in jail. They eventually arrested him and five other, four other people. And uh, one of the things my son said to me, he says, man, it's amazing how much political things, and the pastor was trying to, the, the leader pastor was trying to get them out of jail and get them, get them uh, get them bonded out so they could, they could go ahead and preach and proclaim the gospel of Christ in their area there again. But these people were being persecuted. They were given a hard time in Thessalonica. And let's look what the Bible tells them. Paul responds to them. Verse, verse number 6 of chapter 1, seeing that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. He said, listen, it's only right that God is the great equalizer. He will take care of your light work. He can fix anybody's wagon, and it's, not, it's a right thing. If someone's giving you a hard time against the gospel, he said God knows how to take care of them. Verse number 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse number 9, and read it with me, would you please? Who shall be punished with, from, and from the glory of his power, when he shall come with his glorified saints to be admired of all them that believe, because of our testimony among you was believed in that day. He said the Lord Jesus is going to come, and there's going to be, he's going to have everlasting destruction on those who believe not God, and they will be forever exiled from the presence of God and his power to do anything about it. You get in the worst spots, and all of us have been in bad spots. We've been in a situation, we get a bad spot, we say, oh, Lord, help me. Help me. And God has helped us. And this lifetime, we can cry out to God, and he'll help us. How many are testimonies of that? You know you've been in a difficult time, and God's helped you. Certainly, he said, but there in the lake of fire, it's a place where you're exiled from the presence of God and the glory of his power. There is no hope. There's religious systems that teach once you're in hell, you can get out after a while. That is not one time in the scriptures. It's not there, friend. You're forever exiled from the presence of God and from his power to do anything about it. 
Hell is a place of real distance, real fire, real torment, real pain, real memories, real separation, and real hopelessness. Let's go back to our passage of Scripture in the book of Luke, if you would, please. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attentiveness. I appreciate it very much. The Bible says in verse number 27, And then he said, I pray thee. And by the way, let me go back 26. It says that hence you cannot, you cannot pass. There is, there is, there is hopelessness. There is not. Now, if I tell you you can't do that, take your chances, you probably can. But if God tells you you cannot pass from that place to there, it's over. The, the story's over. Take it to the bank and cash it. It's hopelessness. By the way, any equation without God there is hopelessness. And any bad thing that's happened to you, if God's in the equation, there's hope. There's no hope in hell. It's a place of hopelessness. But we'll say the rest of the chapter tells us it's a place of concern. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, there's someone concerned for you. Well, Jesus is concerned for you. He went to the cross so you could have eternal life. I'm a pastor and I can say generally I love everybody here. Some of you, I don't even know your name and I still love you. And I have concern for you, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister. There are people walking around this planet who, who care about you. But there's other people who care about you. And in hell is a place of real concern for you. Somebody in hell cares about you. There is a place in hell, there's prayer. And it's sad to me that many people in hell are more concerned about souls than I am. People in hell pray every day that you'll get saved. That you'll get over your pride and not come to where they are. No one in hell wants you there. This guy in the midst of hell, he began to petition because he cared about his five brothers. He had five brothers there and he began to pray. He said, if you can't give me relief, if you can't do this to me and put it on my tongue, if you can't breach the, the, the gulf that exists between where we live and where you're going to live forever, then please tell my brother. And he gave him a plan. Now let me tell you, the prayer was not heard. Look and see what the Bible says in verse number 27. He said, then he said, okay, if that can't happen, you can't get to me, you can't get Lazarus to give me temporary relief. You can't wipe away my remember. You can't do all that. Then would you please, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. Everybody in my father's house, my, all my brothers know Lazarus. So would you send Lazarus that he could go to my, to my brothers? They all know him. He stayed outside of our house for years. We've tossed him bread and sandwiches and we've cared for him for years. All the guys know him. Send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that, that testify unto them, and lest they also should come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses, and they have the prophets. Let them hear him. He said, They got a Bible, let them read it. They got a preacher, let them listen to him. He said, Now look though, but if one came back from the dead, they will repent. He said, I know they got a Bible. I know they got First Baptist Church. I know they got a preacher that preaches. But if someone they knew came back from the dead, they would believe. And God disagreed with this rich man. He says, no, sir, they won't. He said to them, if they will not hear the Bible, Moses and the prophets, then I hear God's messengers, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead, raised from the dead. Hell is a place of real distance, real fire, real memories, real separation, real hopelessness, and real genuine concern. But it's also a place of a real exit. There's a real remedy for hell. You don't have to go there. There's two types of people in this room this morning. There's people that are going to hell because you're not truly saved. And there are people that are on their way to heaven who don't care about people going to hell. 
So no, Pastor, I care. Every time someone gets saved, man, I say amen. When's the last time you brought someone to get saved? When's the last time you told your, your brother, your sister, you said, I've told them before, I'm living the life of your neighbor, your friend. It's amazing. Boy, if they could pull back hell for just a moment, how we would be so, we, we, we wouldn't be able to shut up talking to people. I don't want to offend people. Listen, someone's dying, the fire's in their house, you don't worry about offending somebody. Now, I'm all for being diplomatic, I'm all for being kind, but say, I don't want to bring up, now, I don't think you should be harsh to people, but you should care enough about them to give them the gospel. See if they're willing to listen to the gospel of Christ. Put up a warning sign. It's not soul winning. No one wins someone to the Lord, necessarily winning them themselves. It has to be the Spirit of God, the Word of God to draw them. The Word of God needs to be shared. The Spirit of God is bringing conviction. But we are soul warners, giving people the gospel of Christ. Let me say to you, Christians, if you're here and you're not, you're, you've got family members, you've got friends and loved ones and work, work uh, colleagues and, and, and students that you go to school with and people you know, you ought to remember that hell is a real place. And may I say to you one thing about hell that I have not said, it's real long. Really long. Forever long. Now, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Well, we love you, friend. And no one in hell wants you there, but the one who made hell for the devil's angels is the number one reason person that doesn't want you in hell. And he's made a provision for us not to be there. He says it very simply in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world, you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. The word perish, you could put there, go to hell. But would not perish, but have everlasting life. See, you either go into eternity with God's Son or your sin. You either go into eternity with a free pardon or a fair trial. Take your pick. You can have your sins laid out before God, and then you're going to the destined to the lake of fire forever and ever. Or you can say, Lord, I think I'll just take the free pardon. I'll take the gift of eternal life. I want the Son. And the Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life. Let's pray together, can we please?